So I will uh, be uh, delivering today. Um, oh, I know what the issue is here. Okay, so, there we go. Um, and then on Wednesday, we will, uh, Professor Knock and I will, will uh, split the time. Um, what we are doing here um, today, uh, in the next uh, two or three lectures, uh, where we're, um, I, I think, making some adjustments from previous years, is that uh, we're now, I think, the balance of this class is largely technical. Um, there are people in this class who are technical people and have had undergraduate or graduate uh, you know, uh, nuclear physics, or at least a very capable version of modern physics where you learn about quantum mechanics out of nuclei. And then you have people who are um, hardcore STEM people, but maybe not so familiar with nuclear physics. So I'm actually going to um, uh, pace the thing to give enough familiarity with the specifics of nuclear physics as we will need them, and probably not much more. Um, uh, because then I think what we want to do is to do some things which in the, at least the past couple of years um, that we gave, uh, we didn't intend it, but we gave a little bit of short shrift to, um, you know, to get to the kind of the bleeding edge of the whole non-separation issue, we actually do want to talk about where the fuel comes from, fuel cycle, delivery systems, and all that kind of stuff. So we want to really get down to the applications more quickly. So over the next two, uh, three to four lectures, I think we want to wrap up the basics of uh, the atomic nuclear physics that we're going to need. It won't be much. And then we can move on to uh, some more uh, interesting applications. Um, there is a book which I will draw from, uh, which I don't think we've used before, um, uh, which is a book by uh, one of the faculty members in my department, uh, Professor Ed Morse, who wrote a book called Analytical Methods for Nonproliferation. There's a lot of stuff in there that is not going to be uh, necessarily germane to what we're going to do here, but I will glean some things out of there on fuel cycle and other things that will be important. It's available by Springer, and I do believe that through the campus, uh, uh, the campus computer, or if you VPN in, I think you can actually just access it electronically. Mm. Do you know that for a fact? I, I don't. Okay. I Good. Um, all right. Um, so one thing here, just to finish up uh, from last time. Uh, so today I'm actually going to we're going to finish up uh, some details we didn't touch upon, just to uh, limber up on uh, numbers, on uh, Q values, how to navigate through the chart of the, the nuclides. Uh, we'll then talk about. Um, we will then talk about the various uh, ways that atomic nuclei decay, um, alpha, beta, gamma, and we'll get into fission, but I'm thinking that uh, Mr. Matthews here will probably give a, uh, a lecture on uh, fission next week. It's an area where he's actually done and published quite a bit uh, of research himself. Um, one thing here is the following. Uh, uh, Professor Knox mentioned last time uh, there's a rich literature, and I'm, I'm kind of a junkie on this stuff, of histories of the Manhattan Project, um, uh, of which the premier book on Oppenheimer itself was the uh, uh, American Prometheus, um, very thick uh, book, very authoritative biography. Um, uh, there are many others, um, the Brotherhood of the Bomb by Gregory Herkin, now on the faculty at Santa Cruz, that talks about the, the triad there of uh, Oppenheimer, uh, uh, Ernest Lawrence and uh, Edward Teller. And it's interesting, the Manhattan Project, because they, these are all very complex personalities, M most brilliant people, I mean, in the history of 20th century physics, it was the, the Manhattan Project was the distillation of the brilliance of these people. Uh, but they, are, they were vain, complex uh, people that had all kinds of human foibles, but were able to collaborate uh, enough in, in, in this crash program to get the job done. There is another side of the coin when we start talking, particularly about the INF Treaty. Uh, I mentioned delivery systems. Um, let's see, how many of you, if I mention the name Werner von Braun, know who von Braun is? 
Okay. All right. Once again, I'm going to show my age. Um, when I was a kid, Werner von Braun was one of the most famous men in America. I mean, he every school child in America knew who he was. He was as famous as Mickey Mouse, which most of you, unfortunately, I know, know who Mickey Mouse was. Uh, how many how many people know who Mickey Mouse was? Wow. Okay. Um, no, he was again one of the most famous baseball players. He was part part of the, the New York Yankees during their you know the the dynasty years of the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Um, but von Braun was uh, the man who sent us to the moon. And a book I would recommend, I'm actually not finished with it myself, um, but I would say is the authoritative biography and sort of the, the, the flip side of, of you know, uh, Oppenheimer and the American Prometheus. Have you read the book? Yeah, you're a, you're a junkie on these things too, I see. Uh, von Braun was uh, born to a, a fairly uh, wealthy uh, German family. Um, he was um, a, from a very precocious child, did not have a lot of, uh, at least early on, um, patients with formal education. But from the time he was a child, he was um, 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 reading these popularizations in the 1920s in German by uh, Hermann Oberth and Willy Bay and so forth who dreamt, it was really science fiction at the time, about space travel and rockets. At that time, no one even knew what a rocket was. I mean, the Chinese made these gunpowder rockets and the, you know, several hundred years ago, fireworks and so forth. Um, you know, the, the great pioneer who worked relative obscurity at the time, of course, was Robert Goddard, uh, American. Um, but von Braun, um, he set his goals on, uh, and he got involved in kind of a, it was kind of like a hobby activity or club activity with a number of people, including some people who popularized it and got some private money coming into it to build rockets, um, most primitive rockets. Uh, as a child, uh, I think when he was about nine or 10, he took his wagon, like all of us when we were kids had the little wagon with the little wheels and so forth, um, and basically constructed um, a, uh, a three by three solid fuel rocket motor to this thing and launched it down the sidewalk of a busy street on Sunday. And I forget what this was in Munich or something. You know, there were gentlemen out there with their wives and baby carriages. And all of a sudden they had this rocket going and, you know, putting out a, like a tail of a comet. And it was, uh, and he was howling with delight. And of course, the police grabbed him by the back of the neck and gave him to his father and told him to keep him in the house for a week or something like this. Anyway, he then, the, 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 the German government during at the rise of National Socialism in the 1930s, all of a sudden began taking notice in this and beginning to realize its, its uh, military value. Um, uh, at the time uh, that uh, you know, Hitler came fully to power, uh, he was then given, in the same way that Oppenheimer, uh, not to, to, quite to the same degree, um, was set up in Funamunda on the Baltic coast there. There's a series of islands up there. And, and from the time he was in his early, uh, his mid, late 20s, 30s, he went from a group of three people to 15 people to 100 people to 300 people to 3,000 people. All of a sudden, he had undreamt of resources to begin a rocket program by which Hitler could rain destruction down on the British through what was ultimately, it was called the A4 at the time, later called the V2 rocket. Uh, all the time he was thinking, yeah, yeah, we're doing, you know, we're, we're carrying out the war right now, but he kept dreaming about going to the moon and everyone thought literally he was a lunatic. Um, now, in his case, the bargain with the devil was that he was required at some point to join uh, the National Socialist Party, become a Nazi. And at some point, I think, pressure was put on him to become an SS officer, wear a black uniform. He, to a lesser degree than Oppenheimer, was a man who was very abstracted, really wanted to do his science and just saw the army and the, the Luftwaffe and the, the, the central German government as a way of bankrolling his science. He did not have, and, and this book is pretty unsparing. It gives a pretty unvarnished description of him. A lot of moral, uh, many moral sensitivities at the time or maybe turned a blind eye to the fact that there was in fact forced labor, prison labor um, uh, from the concentration camps that at some point were doing the construction. But the huge 
industrial complex got behind building this rocket. And there was failure after failure after failure after failure. And then finally, this thing began to succeed and they began to build multi stage rockets and so forth. At one point, it became very clear that the, the war was going badly, but they continued to um, build these things. And at some point, they, they started launching these things on London several hundred miles away and causing you know, an immense amount of casualties. And you know, these things were coming down at Mach 3 with a ton of warhead on them. Um, the, at the end of the war, <clears throat> <laughs> the Americans and the Soviets came in, and I, I don't quite know whether by design or choice or whatever, the Russians got half and we got half. I think we got the slightly better half. And then you ended up with competing space programs. And so you had, they were, of course, had to be examined and, you know, in a certain sense, you know, we got these people who were, in fact, you know, um, a, a central part of the, of the German war program. Um, they were then, uh, he and his core group of about 40 people were sent to Huntsville, Alabama, what was the, the Redstone Arsenal, still exists today. And they began to reconstruct what the V2 was and then to build larger and larger things, both for military and civilian purposes. By, and when we were children, all of a sudden we had failures on the launch pad after the Russia, Russians had already put their satellite in space, the Sputnik. Um, and, but finally the Vanguard, I think it was 1959, we finally sent a successful satellite into orbit. Uh, and then Von Braun, you know, was the master architect that had the Mercury program. It's an Alan Shepard of suborbital flight and John Glenn of orbital flight. The Gemini, two people in space capsule, the Apollo, and, and then we sent man to the moon July 16th, 1969, will be 50 years this summer. Um, but, uh, and he was, he was idolized, and his Nazi background was, you know, again, we made our, our bargain with uh, Von Braun was, I mean, he had, I think, I also repented of this, I think, but I think history has largely airbrushed a lot of his background. But this book is, is very unsparing. It's a very truthful book and very deeply and well, uh, well, well uh, um, uh, researched book. Uh, do, you may all know of this book or others, Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good book. Okay, uh, back. Uh, we digress, uh, but read it. It's a it's a wonderful read. <clears throat> um, so just a review here, um, and I uh, don't like to go over this too many times, but the in this case I think it's important because the the fact that you have two or three separate conventions uh, for the um, uh, for looking for tabulating. The masses of atomic nuclei, so you can do core function calculator uh, <clears throat> numbers. Um, it, it, you want to make sure that you you get this right. So we said, look, we have the proton and the neutron almost the same mass. The neutron is ever so slightly heavier, right? about an MeV and a half of what's roughly a GeV, billion electron volts. The electron, which balances the electric charge and, and causes and creates this uh, atomic uh, cloud, large fluffy atomic cloud around the atomic nucleus is almost a factor 2,000 times uh, lighter. We have defined, who, I don't know who did this, uh, but for a long time we have defined an atomic mass unit as one twelfth of the mass of a carbon nucleus fully dressed, i.e. the nucleus plus the electrons. One can forget about the electrons because whenever you have A plus E going to C plus D or A going to B plus C, um, electric charge is conserved and the mass of the electrons on either side drops out. So the fact that whoever in their infinite wisdom defined the A and U to also include the electrons is not a problem whatsoever. What is most commonly done, and we're actually now going to look at uh, the chart of the nucleus, I want to familiarize you with it, um, is this thing called the mass excess, which is to say, let's take a look at a sodium-23 nucleus. A is the integer 23, and the mass excess simply describes to say, okay, if the uh, sodium-23 nucleus had exactly the same binding energy per nucleon as a carbon-12, the mass excess would be zero. Um, so it's really the mass in atomic mass units minus that integer, might be slightly higher, might be slow, slightly less, times this number 931 plus 5. Notice 
because the carbon nucleus is bound, and bound things weigh less than things which are unbound, the component parts. This is about 8 MeV lighter than um, the mass of the proton, or, or the average of the mass of the proton. And as I said, it's a little bit like saying, you know, we can describe uh, Bill as being 185 centimeters and Julie as 169 centimeters. And so you can tabulate people in centimeters, or you can say, look, an average person is 180, you are plus five, you are minus 11, and so forth. So the atomic mass unit is simply, in a sense, tabulating the difference between an average binding energy nucleus. That's just think of it that way. Okay, now let's actually do a number um, here. Oh, let's first go. We, we did not get a chance to navigate yet. Um, so there we have, uh, for example, okay, I just out of the air, I talked about sodium 23. It has an atomic mass of 22.9898, uh, which means that it's uh, ever so slightly bound more tightly per nucleon than the carbon 12 is. Carbon 12, of course, will always be, uh, the, the AMU will always be uh, 12 by definition, like that. Notice that there are things um, uh, uh, which um, <clears throat> you could say, aha, here is, for example, the uranium 235. Uh, this is 235.0439. You actually say, ah, okay, the mass excess here is positive. Um, However, it's not unbound. It's just what we used to say is that its binding is slightly less than the average binding per nucleon of, of the carbon 12. And of course, you remember that curve of binding energy. We'll look at it again in just a second. Okay, so on we go. Here is um, all you really need to do. You don't need to memorize this thing. You just have some NNEC National Nuclear Data Center in Brookhaven Lab in, in Long Island, where I did my thesis. Uh, for whatever reason, I was not able to successfully embed the link here. It, it uh, fails me. Uh, so what we will do <coughs> is actually just go to the web and uh, we'll play around a little bit because this will be useful for you to do problems. And as soon as it finds air bears, away we'll go. Now, Eric here lives and breathes this data chart. He, he, he spends hours a day rummaging around the, 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 the chart of the nucleides and other tables in the, in the data center here, because that's his, his uh, main line of work. Uh, okay, here we go. And so he knows this much better than I do. So all you need to do is actually see the little white hand there, simply click on the chart of the nucleus. Okay, now we're live. Okay, um, so let's do something here. Oh, well, let me just, um, uh, we'll talk about the structure, for those of you who are uh, maybe not too deeply steeped in nuclear physics, we'll talk about what the, uh, the, 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 the chart of the nucleus here, uh, uh, the, the general features of it, Along the x-axis is neutron number, along the y-axis is proton number. So things are elementally what they are by, by the, the row that they are on uh, here. So z of 82, n of 126 is led to O. The stuff that gives reason for this course is up here in the actinide region, okay, in plutonium and all the good and the bad. Um, so, uh, so actually, let's take a look, for example, um, just for fun, uh, we'll go to, uh, for example, carbon 12. Um, you can just drop it in here. Uh, everything in black there, the squares in the black are, are, are things which are absolutely stable. On the right-hand side, you can see the color code, which tells how long that that nucleus lives. Most nuclei or isotopes are unstable for one reason or another. Anyway, we're now on carbon-12, but you say, I don't see anything different. Now you have to zoom in. Okay, so there we are. And you'll notice that um, uh, right here, there's a little blue square around the thing that you've clicked on. And um, there, when the moving hand is on it, you can actually see the half-life. It says it's stable, therefore has no decay modes, and so forth. 
Uh, down here, let me scroll up. Right underneath it gives the mass excess, in which case, by, as we say, by definition, it's zero. For that isotope, if it tells you if it's a stable isotope, what is the abundance in nature? In other words, if I dig into the Earth's crust, how much of that stuff is there? Now, it's 99% abundant. That's because there's also carbon uh, 13, which is stable as well. Right here. Okay. Carbon 14 is not stable. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. That happens to be a beta emitter, and it turns out is an important chronometer for, for geologists uh, and for any, any, uh, lots and lots of other people as well. You do lots of forensic stuff with carbon-14. Um, OK, so let's back up. We'll, we'll zoom out. Um, and we'll look up here in the uranium uh, region. Again, you can just kind of rough it in. You don't have to get it exactly. You can just kind of rough it in. And um, there is screwed up here. Let's try again. I'm going to just zoom out. There we are. Okay. It didn't click hard enough. There's your AM-235, and I'm going to zoom in. There we are. And see the little blue square is on your AM-235. Um, and, and this thing tells you many interesting things. Uh, it tells you the spin and the parity of the ground state. The half-life we see is uh, uh, 700 million years. And then, uh, whoops, uh, and then it tells you how it decays. <laughs> Um, the, uh, it uh, uh, basically is alpha emitter 100% of the time with the 700 million year half-life. Uh, tiny, 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 tiny fraction. SF is not San Francisco, it's spontaneous fusion and so forth. But again, if I uh, scroll down here, uh, it also tells you for the ground state, what is the mass excess? And the mass excess is 40.9 MeV. So let's do a simple calculation. Uh, we'll zoom back out. And let's do the following thing. We talked about it before. Um, let's do the simplest fusion reaction, or the fusion reaction, the, the money maker, uh, which is deuterium plus tritium goes to helium-4 um, plus uh, a neutron. <coughs> Okay, um, this is also uh, hydrogen two. This is hydrogen three. And um, there we have it. So actually, let's calculate the Q value for this reaction. Um, will we'll just be the mass excess of, of the deuterium? Minus okay. <clears throat> so let's do some numbers here. So we'll just get into the into the neighborhood. There we are. Okay. So 13.14 for the, the neuron. Remember, whenever you see a mass excess that's a positive number, that means to say it's less well bound than um, uh, carbon 12. And now the tritium. 14.95. Now, helium-4 is a very, very, very stable nucleus. Um, it's one of the, just like atoms, you know, in atoms you have uh, uh, what are called the noble elements. What are the noble elements? 
Yeah, and they are, uh, they tend not to, to enter much into chemical reactions because they're tightly, they're, they're tightly bound by themselves. Um, in atoms or in nuclei, you also have magic numbers. You have where, which are resulting once again of closed shells, if you know that parlance from your, your, your chemistry, your atomic physics. Um, so, uh, and, and these are atoms which are particularly stable uh, and helium is one of these things that particularly, particularly stable. Let's see if I can remember them. I'll probably, if Eric were giving me a screening exam, I would fail. So there's helium four. Who's my, who's, where's our nuclear physicists here, nuclear engineers? Well, yeah, okay. So, so what are, do you remember the magic numbers in atomic nuclei? Well, yeah, it's like two, six, one, eight, eight. Yeah. Eight, not six. Yeah, eight, two, eight. Uh, yeah, um, so oxygen 16 is doubly magic, eight plus eight. Uh, calcium 40, 20 plus 20. Uh, then you start getting a slight preference for neutrons over protons, but yeah, so you have um, um, 50, like 10 is atomic number 50, so that tends to be tightly bound. 126. And 82. And, and excuse me, I missed 82. Okay. Um, but anyway, I digress. So let's take a look at helium four. The, the, notice that the uh, this is a fairly no, low number, two point four five, and then the neutron um, should be about plus eight or something, as I recall. From this uh, here's the neutron, eight point oh seven. That's simply the difference between the 931.5 and the 939. whatever it is, 8.07. Now, we'll just, okay. So we'll just do this fairly roughly. That plus that is roughly 28. We've got a calculator to do this exactly. Um, this plus this is, um, And this plus this is, uh, let's just call that 10.5. And therefore, when I subtract these two, you can't see it. Lo and behold, this is the number I showed you on the slide before. That's the energy release when I fuse deuterium plus tritium, and it gives rise to a neutron and a helium four. Now, um, you hear all the time people talk about 14 MeV neutrons. That's synonymous with a fusion neutron. And that's simply because when I instantaneously form this mass five system, and then it decays into the helium four nucleus, plus the neutron, just by kinematics, um, it's a little bit like jumping off of a rowboat. They actually share the energy, and the heavier one partner is, the more of the energy that the other one gets. So when you just work out the, the elementary kinematics, this comes out with 14.1, Eric, and this is 3.5. There is a little bit of recoil energy. Um, in terms of their kinetic energy. Okay, so lo and behold. Okay, let's do something fun. Just to make sure you're you're able you're limber to do the numbers that you want to do. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, Suppose I take a gram of deuterium tritium mixture and I fuse it. I, I manage to get 100% efficient fusion of, the, uh, of, of, of that amount. Um, what's the energy release? Take a guess. Anybody has a wild guess how much energy it loses if I fuse 
one gram of a 50-50 yeast mixture. Hmm? Um, let's see. Well, let's do the calculation. Okay, so here's the thing. So here, now here, my geochemists know this thing. If I have an atomic number A, how many moles do I have? Or how many moles there are? How, how do you calculate if I say I have a gram of something, how many moles do I have for something whose atomic weight is A? Yes, so it takes a molar, for example, um, uh, okay, so if I had, uh, for example, uh, so we're going to take one gram of 50 50 PT. Then to not only see what next, right? So you need to set one gram equal to whatever the ratio is between the alpha. Yeah. Well, this is this is mass two. This is mass three. So the average is two and a half. Um. So how many atoms do I have there? Um. Is one over two point five moles. <clears throat> Um, and uh, a mole is six point zero two times ten to the twenty third. Okay. Now let me ask the question. So this is a fifty fifty mixture. So I'm going to have. So this is a total of three times ten to the twenty third or so. Uh, or two and a half, ten to the twenty-third, something like that. Um, um, I'm going to have one and a half, ten to the twenty-third deuterium fusing with one and a half times ten to the twenty-third tritium. How much energy release from that fusion? Well, it's going to be this. That's the, the this this is just the number of atoms or the number of species. However, there's it takes one of each to cause the fusion reaction, and then each fusion reaction now has uh, 1.7, call it 1.8, just round these things off, times 10 to the seventh EV. And who remembers what, um, uh, how much, uh, if I want to speak in ordinary language, how many joules is it ED? 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Yeah. 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. So, now, this is very convenient because that number times that number is uh, almost spot on the number 10. Uh, okay, so I have 10 to the 24th, 10 to the minus 19. That, uh, these two together make 10 to the fifth. Spot on. Let's see if I did that right. Yes. Um, and um, 2.5 into, or actually 5 over 6, that's about. Uh, uh, 1.2 uh, here and uh, times 1.8 um, times 10 to the fifth. So this is approximately, I did something terribly wrong. Yes, I, I forgot the 10 to the seventh. This is 10 to the 12th. 10 to the fifth plus uh, 10 to the 12th. So it's roughly two times 10 to the 12 joules. Now, who remembers from an earlier view graph the significance of that number or a number in the neighborhood? Hint, I show you a picture of a mushroom cloud. Do you want to do the No. 
one kiloton is 4.24 or 10 to the 12 joules. So this is approximately half a megaton. Excuse me, half a kiloton. A kiloton is uh, 4.24, 10 to the 12 joules. So this tiny amount of liquid deuterium tritium, one gram, would give you uh, an explosive yield of half a kiloton. So now you've done the numbers and you're sort of, you're, you're, you're limbered up uh, here. Okay, this is the kind of calculation that you should be uh, able to do. And for those of you who haven't done, um, you know, done maybe chemistry rather than nuclear physics, it's just like everything you've done before, except on a, uh, a slightly larger energy scale. Uh, okay, there we have it. Other things about the nuclear data table uh, we don't need to do today, uh, but I think maybe when Eric gives his lecture, you may give them a little bit more of an expert navigation around the, the data and show them all the other riches that are, are here in the, uh, the Brookhaven uh, Center. Okay. Now, there's some things here um, that are kind of interesting. Uh, when you look at this, um, uh, it just, you just get a, a visual impression of this. Everything in black is stable. Uh, the number of isotopes that are known uh, that uh, exist in nature or that are, uh, uh, you know, man-made in nuclear physics experiments, cyclotrons and uh, reactors and so forth, is in the thousands. Um, now, the first thing you should appreciate about the chart of nuclei is that it stops at some point. You know, one of the great scientific exploits that's been going on is actually Berkeley's been a leader in it for many decades is the creation of super heavy elements. There, there comes a point where it, it, you simply uh, will get to a point where it will be impossible uh, for nuclei to be bound anymore, at least in you know, small numbers of, of, of nucleons. Uh, we have created uh, at accelerators in Russia and in Germany and Berkeley, uh, uh, elements up to, who remembers, Z of? Yeah, actually 120. Um, and um, the, uh, and uh, the cause of this ultimately is, is, the, is the fact that, the, you know, that nuclei are charged um, and, you know, they're, they're down here, everything is roughly 50-50. All of a sudden, you notice that the, the valley, so the valley stability, starts bending over simply because the additional coulombic energy makes uh, uh, that makes nuclei intrinsically less stable, and therefore, for a particular A, uh, and each atomic number A represents a diagonal slice through here. We'll actually show some pictures. Uh, I'll actually show some charts of the of the binding energy or the mass excess for various slices, what are called A-chains, through the, the chart of the nucleides. Um, and therefore, as you get heavier and heavier, nature favors uh, stability, will favor more neutron-rich isotopes. Um, and ultimately, what you're releasing in the fission process, which we'll talk about in a while, is actually the, the pent-up, the built-up uh, coulombic charge in this bound uh, nucleus. So you have nuclei which are intrinsically unstable, but are uh, kept together by a potential barrier. Uh, but if you can, under the right circumstances, you can get the two fragments to cis, to scission, and then, and then they, they lock it apart by their Coulombic, mutual Coulombic compulsion like that. Ultimately, you can't find atomic nuclei heavier than a uh, Probably well, so far not heavier than 120. We simply the the, the the simply impossible for nuclei to bind. Theorists hypothesize, and people are looking at what's called an island of stability. There may be a little bit of a gap, and then some very super heavy elements. There may be a last gas where you find another uh, dozen or so isotopes um, on a new island of stability. We talk about magic numbers. Um, the <coughs> the bars here, the rows and columns are nuclei of particular type bonding. And the, the, where you see these things cross are what are called double magic nuclei. You have helium-4, um, you have um, the oxygen-16, you have calcium-40, 
Um, uh, this one here already is uh, is doubly magic, but is actually I think unstable uh, <coughs> because the value stability already is is, is bent over like this. Um, you have a very special one here, which was lead 208 uh, up here, 126 neutrons and 82 protons. Just like in atomic physics, chemical physics, um, the, the, these especially tightly bound special nuclei called um, a, uh, noble elements in chemistry here called magic uh, nuclei here uh, are due to shell closures, places where you get this, these quantum levels and then a large gap. That's a condition for stability. Mental image, think about this as um, like a, a real valley. Uh, I'll show you in just a second. If I take one of these A chains, if I take a slice through the chart of nuclei, I will see that the nucleus in uh, the, the black nuclei down here are at the bottom of the valley, and that when I uh, migrate uh, up or down like this, the mass excess. Uh, the, uh, of these nuclei goes up generally parabolically, but it, but, it, but it goes up. But So let me show you this. Here's A of 140. Um, cerium uh, is, is uh, bound here. And um, the, um, uh, here, this is a, uh, a, a, an even, even nucleus here. If I have an even uh, nucleus here, then one of two things can, uh, uh, what will happen is that uh, as I start walking up the, the wall of the valley, either more proton rich or more neutron rich, you'll have, you'll go from even, even, odd, odd, even, even, odd, odd, even, even, odd, odd. Um, and it turns out, uh, such as the two numbers total 140, it turns out that nuclei, which are uh, the even numbers, give greater stability than odd numbers. So odd, odd nuclei tend to be very un, uh, less stable than even even. So here you get a little bit more of a jagged contour. But you see there is this kind of valley. And what's interesting is that when you look at this, this is also from the, the old bound version at the end of the end of these table. Um, we'll talk about the case shortly, but if you, it's actually interesting, the progression you see up here uh, the half-life, which we'll talk about here. This is 1.3 seconds. It decays by uh, uh, electron capture or positron emission to uh, Sumerian 140. That's 14.8 minutes. This one is now um, uh, 5.9 minutes. Uh, this one is 3.37 days, 3.39 minutes, and so forth. Um, here you see 0.8 seconds, 14 seconds, 65 seconds, 12.8 days. 40.3 40 hours, and then this thing is stable. So if I create, we'll talk about the case shortly, if I create an isotope up in the walls of the valley, it will begin to dribble down by either beta decay or positron decay or electron capture down into the valley. And you actually notice if the, if the energy difference is large, it goes fast. If the energy difference is small, it goes slow. We won't get into a lot of detail here. Um, Here's an example of an odd nucleus. This is actually a little bit simpler um, be, in a sense because uh, if I go from the most stable nucleus here, here's presidinium, and I go to neodymium, uh, what? Yeah. Yes, uh, and, and then samarium and europium here. Uh, uh, as I go up here, I, it's odd, odd, it's odd even either way. So you actually see a little bit more of a regular structure. And here you notice things which are very unbound. Uh, here's a, for example, the beta emitters, half a second. This is, um, this is IAD 141, 1. 1.7 seconds, 25 seconds, 18 minutes, 3.9 hours, uh, and then 33 days um, for this thing to, to rank down like that. I'll show you something a, a little better. Uh, uh, the, 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 these things, in principle, are supposed to be rather parabolic, but they sometimes they look rather ratty. We did an example before, but you can check your, you can actually see if you can reproduce what we did. Um, see if you can take this slide when I put up the B courses and then check to see that you actually get the, uh, the right P value. Okay. Um, this was an important thing. Drill this into your mind. Uh, we just calculated um, a, uh, a, uh, the 
the energy gain Q value for a fusion reaction way down here um, because helium four is very, is very very tightly bound nucleus. So you're, you're actually you're able to get two two nuclei which are not well bound, deuterium and tritium, um, and into a tightly bound nucleus and then ejecting a very high energy neutron. Here we mentioned before um, the other uh, money maker is uh, to fizz very heavy nuclei. Um, and here you can see as before, the average binding energy per nucleon uh, uh, here at the peak of the curve is about eight and a half MeV, down here at seven and a half. So by taking a uranium nucleus or plutonium nucleus into two pieces, uh, then uh, in fact, you gain about one MeV per nucleon. And therefore you, you're going to gain something on the order of 200 plus MeV of energy. And that's where the, the bang in, 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 in uh, fission comes from for both reactors and, and bombs. Okay. Uh, let's see, I think, okay, there's a toolkit. Let's go on, ah, this is, I think this is rather interesting here. This is old patent, I think people do. Why we have nuclear engineering departments. Uh, a gigawatt power plant per year. What are the fuel requirements? Coal, 2.5 million tons, 250 trains of 100 cars each. Fusion, uh, 100 pounds of deuterium, 150 pounds of tritium. You can actually get the, the tritium by cracking six. You can carry it in the back of a, a pickup truck. Okay. That's the that's the, the value proposition. Uh, fission reactor is uh, uh, these we know how to make and they work. Fusion does not yet work. Uh, even so, it's just simply a rail car of fuel for you. Okay, let me switch to a new slide set. We're moving briskly. How to nuclei decay. All right, we'll talk about radioactive uh, decay um, and uh, with uh, fission being uh, a separate case, which will deserve special attention here. Uh, again, I think this is, uh, these things uh, should be largely familiar um, because um, um, I think in almost uh, every discipline of science, um, you know, even the people who do, um, you know, uh, who are developing new methods of uh, positron emission tomography, uh, you know, uh, in bioengineering or in the Valley Life Science Building who are, you know, um, you know injecting uh, mice with, uh, uh, you know, nitrogen 15 or carbon, carbon 11 or something like that. Um, uh, beta emitters, positron emitters, alpha emitters are a tool of the trade for many, many, many aspects of, 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 of science here. So I think these things are familiar to even the people who are not, you know, go up to nuclear physics or nuclear engineering. Alpha decay uh, is a process uh, by which, uh, and, and this is predominantly in very heavy nuclei, uh, this example is going to 40, um, it will eject uh, an alpha particle, helium-4 nucleus, uh, and give you uh, a daughter nucleus, which is four nucleons lighter. The spectrum you see uh, in, invariably tends to be, if you look with high resolution, sharp lines simply because um, the alpha particle going out will actually populate not simply the ground state, uh, but often some excited, discrete excited states. And the higher the state that you're populating, the less energy comes out with the alpha particle. On the main, alpha emission typically will give you alpha particles uh, in the vicinity of 5 MeV, 4 MeV, 8 MeV, something. Lifetimes can be years to billions of years. Um, interestingly, the lightest alpha emitter is a bit of a surprise to me. It's a bit of an oddity. You can actually find uh, things in the mass 140 or 150 range. I think it's the lightest alpha emitter. I think you have. go down to tellurium 106, which is 106. The yeah. What's the half life and energy? Do you not remember? Oh, it's very short. Okay. <coughs> um, Okay. Now, 
I always ask people to think about the chart of the nuclei as a bit like a chessboard. When you learn chess, you have to know how the pieces move, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the rook moves, you know, uh, up and down, and uh, left and right, and the, the knight moves two up and one over, and so forth. If here's plutonium 240, uh, where do you end up on the chart after alpha emission? Yes, I got it. Either two down, and, two down, and two to the left, or just uh, two down diagonally like that. Once again, when you start navigating around the the, the NNC database, you will actually see there. You you actually see up here. You see, in fact, everything is 100% uh, alpha emission. And uh, when you look at the little uh, chart on uh, underneath there, you would actually, you can actually see what energies are emitted, what the uh, the, the uh, lifetime is actually you see the lifetime right here. There, are 240, you see it's about 6,600 years. It's a very useful thing. Let's talk about beta decay. Beta decay um, is a three body final state. There's some physics here which is completely un, un, uh, not useful to us uh, having to do with neutrinos. But here, if I have a nucleus which is in a certain sense imbalanced, it may have too many neutrons to be comfortable or too many prototypes to be comfortable, it can lose energy um, by, uh, for example, if the thing is too neutron rich, um, then uh, it can emit a, um, uh, a uh, beta particle uh, and the one of the neutrons becomes a proton. And now you have the same atomic nucleus, but you go from six protons and eight neutrons to seven and seven. So you've actually created a more stable nucleus like that. Here, uh, the, if I look at the uh, electrons, um, beta uh, uh, process uh, can give you electrons which sometimes are very, very, very soft to uh, very, very hard. Um, I think if you look at the beta decay of tritium, tritium goes to helium three. Um, the endpoint there of the uh, of the spectrum is 18.6 keV. It's a very soft beta particle. Um, <clears throat> now, notice that you don't get a sharp line; you get a smear. And the reason you get a smear is that here, statistically, uh, the energy can actually be shared. Remember, if I have a two-body final state and I give up a finite amount of energy, it's completely prescriptive what the momentum and energy of the two particles is. If I have three. They can trade off, you know, the electron and the neutrino can go in the same direction, give a large recoil to the nucleus, or they could all roughly share the same momentum and go at, at, at wide angles to one another. So you see a continuum spectrum here, but on the main, uh, beta uh, emitters will typically be in the hundreds of kilovolts or maybe a few MeV. Rarely do you see something of many, many MeV beta emitters unless the thing is truly short-lived. It was uh, the, the, the ghostly neutrino particles <coughs> will treat as massless. I'm not going to have any make calculations here. Um, it was a crisis in nuclear physics in the 1930s because they began to see events where they would see, um, for example, um, a lithium um, uh, uh, nucleus and uh, a beta particle coming out, and they weren't back to back. And uh, the um, they said, "God, it looks like at the subatomic level, momentum and energy are not being conserved." Um, but of course, it turned. And then uh, uh, the uh, Wolfgang Pauli was the one who hypothesized to say, "Okay, uh, sort of a last gasp." He said, "Let's assume that there is a particle here which is so weakly interacting we don't see it in our film emulsion." ball chamber or to our cloud chamber or whatever. And sure enough, 20 years later, the experimentalists had actually been able to find, uh, actually able to detect these ghostly neutrinos, which can go through you know, many, many, many light years of lead before interacting, and, and then everything was fine. No one really wanted to believe that energy and momentum were not conserved. OK, a bit more in beta decay. <coughs> um, think of the neutrinos, anti-neutrinos as having no rest mass. Um, it's important across the whole chart of the nuclei. Um, you see them very light nuclei. You can see the very heavy nuclei. You can see them from 
seconds to millions of years, um, few kAV to many MeV. Now, okay, once again, here's the chessboard. There's carbon-14. That's a very important beta emitter. <coughs> Where does it bring you? Hmm. Yes. Whoops, sorry. There we go. Up into the left. So it keeps the atomic number the same. Everything on that descending diagonal line is the same atomic number, uh, but it makes the thing uh, uh, one more uh, unit uh, positive. Now, for this course, I mean, most everything that we, when we talk about, uh, when we're just talking about uh, nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, and so forth, uh, although you have processes which can go from, uh, uh, you know, take uh, proton-rich nuclei, and they can begin to uh, decay down to the valley of stability. Most everything that we're going to be concerned about is not positron emission, but beta emission. And there's a simple reason for that that we'll talk about. Um, why are we, most of the things we talk about end up being more... Oh, I'm trying to break the board. I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit, but in the chart of the nuclei, for the, the reasons I explained before, and then it kind of goes on a little bit further, like that. Um, this is what a diagonal line would be. Um, there's a slight curvature to this. Um, and when I fizz something up here, for example, um, 236 uranium, 235 uranium plus a neutron, or um, plutonium 240, 239 plus a neutron, um, what happens is that um, you, you don't get a deterministic split. You actually can create any number of pairs, but the nuclei you are going to create will be, as we'll see shortly, in heavy fragment and light fragment, but they're all going to be south of the valley of stability. So the decays are always going to be going in that direction. So to get to the valley of stability, you're going from things which are more neutron rich to more proton rich. Therefore, <coughs> most everything of interest to us are going to be beta emitters rather than positive quantities. But it's precisely that. It's because of the, the fact that the, the, the valley of stability, the chart of nuclei, bends like this. And when I fission a nucleus here, I get typically fission fragments, which are very neutron rich. OK. Um, gamma decay, um, this can happen uh, uh, in, it happens all the time. When I have a nuclear reaction, I, um, I bring an um, uh, uh, alpha particle on carbon-12, I form oxygen-16. Uh, there is, in fact, a tiny uh, the very important branching ratio for a high energy gamma to go right to the carbon 12 or the oxygen 16 ground state. Uh, it happens when I create fission fragments. We'll talk about fission uh, because the, the, these uh, nuclei which come apart tend to be very hot. They're in high excited states. How do nuclei shed energy? Just like atoms, which are near excited, they tend to send down a little cascade of, of gamma rays. And since both in atoms and in nuclei, you have a level structure these transitions will be uh, give off discrete packets of photons, which we call uh, photons. Uh, in atomic uh, physics, these photons will tend to be uh, of an EV or fractions of an EV. When you're talking about atomic nuclei, these level diagrams, which uh, I glossed over before, um, they, they tend to be in the uh, hundreds of kDV to MeV range. And that's what gives the characteristic uh, spectrum of, uh, of gammas. Um, again, this is something of interest across campus, even to people in life sciences and <coughs> chemistry and material science and so forth, um, uh, because of the use of isotopes uh, for tracers, diagnostics, and so forth. And um, the spectrum uh, of the gamma decay of a particular nucleus um, is, um, is of enormous 
forensic importance. It really is a fingerprint that actually tells you a lot of, about what the thing is and uh, its provenance and, uh, uh, and, and so forth. In the case of fission, we'll talk about fission shortly, you can get um, some gammas emitted very quickly. They, they're emitted typically at 10 to the minus 18 seconds or so. Uh, but then you get many of them, once, once things start beta decaying, if something doesn't beta decay to the ground state, but beta decays to the excited state, you'll get these gammas that are emitted after the emission of uh, a beta as well. And therefore, when you're doing spectroscopy in the laboratory, you see a beta being emitted very often, you'll see a gamma emitted exactly at the same time. <clears throat> Is a, 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 a gamma spectra, like beta spectra, like alpha spectra, have great the forensic value, and that's something I'm most interested in doing. Okay, um, again, old hat here. Uh, this is the kind of thing when you go online, you take your your general safety training at Cal, um, and you know the people in, uh, who are dealing with uh, you know biologists who are dealing with mice and so forth like that. They're giving them. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of buildings that you have to remodel and remediate are, are loaded with carbon-14, tritium, and so forth, simply because they've had life scientists in there with their mice for many, many years, um, phosphorus-31. Uh, so as I say, lots of people are familiar with radiation of all types, and this is the kind of thing when you go on and do your one-hour safety training, everybody learns. Uh, alpha particles uh, actually are very energetic, but they slow down and stop in the layer of the skin. So if you don't ingest it, alpha particles will never hurt you. Um, how do alpha particles typically, alpha particles can hurt you if you, yeah, uh, typically if they become airborne. And uh, uh, for example, radon is an is a, is a, uh, alpha emitter and uh, that can seep up in places of you know, Appalachia, well, lots of places all around the world that actually get radon emission from the crust of the earth that comes out of construction material like concrete and so forth. Um, so anything you breathe or becomes airborne and gets into your lungs, then um, even though the range of the alpha particle might be some number of microns, uh, it will go, it will be going directly into living tissue and cause genetic damage and cancers and so forth. <coughs> Betas being only charged one and very fast <coughs> are slightly more penetrating. Um, and, um, but once again, a very thin sheet of practically anything will stop any beta of interest, like a, uh, you know, a 16 inch of aluminum generally will stop any beta. So they're, they're actually easy to screen out. Gammas are very penetrating, uh, again, depending on the energy. Uh, but uh, when you get gamma rays in several MEV, uh, MEV range, um, they will um, penetrate through many centimeters of material. Um, and uh, the way to take them out is a high Z material. They actually, they, the, the, uh, the things which are most efficacious for stopping gammas will be things like lead, for example. Uh, neutrons can go large distances uh, and, and generally require, for example, our DD high flux neutron generator in Etcheberry Hall, which I think many of you seen, if not, I will give you a tour. Um, that is in a vault with a six foot, um, you know, steel loaded concrete, high density concrete uh, walls to it. Because, uh, you know, they, it will take a lot of time to, uh, it, 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 many, many uh, interactions and scatterings before they will be uh, absorbed. Okay. All right. Any questions, by the way? I should stop. Everybody, uh, is this uh, everyone's, everyone's copacetic here? Good. Uh, okay, again, this is, I think, uh, familiar to everyone, and particularly, I think, to our uh, people with uh, uh, also in uh, the earth sciences as well. Uh, uh, because of, of certain isotopes are very useful as chronometers, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, nuclei, uh, I mean, this is a law of physics. Anything that is not forbidden is mandatory. I think it was a whimsical saying of Pauli. Uh, if a process is energetically allowed and there's no what are called conservation laws or uh, symmetries which prevent the decay, eventually it will happen. And generally, the, li the larger the energy, uh, the energy difference, uh, the faster that process will go. We just saw 
case studies of that when we looked at these various A chains there. The larger the uh, difference in the uh, mass excess, the faster that process went. When the energy is very, very, very slightly different, then it can be uh, millions, billions of years. Um, random process, um, uh, so it's, it, it, this is an exponential decay law, is a statistical law. If I take a population of atoms uh, or a population of nuclei, um, and all in, if it's, you know, that, that are all in a state which allows them to decay, you can't tell which one, it's like popcorn, and you can't tell which one is going to uh, go, uh, but on the average in a large number, 50% will decay in what's called uh, 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 a uh, half-life. Um, the basis of it is, is that it, it is to say that in a, if a sufficiently short period of time, uh, if I take a look at any particular nucleus that can decay, uh, the, um, <coughs> the probability for it to decay is um, lambda times delta t. Um, and what's interesting is, uh, you know, for people who are maybe not familiar with statistics, you could say, well, here's an atom, and uh, it has a half-life of, uh, let's say, our nucleus, it has a, you know, 4.6 hours, and I wait 30 seconds and it didn't decay. It would have a certain, you know, probability for decaying in that 30 seconds if it, if, you know, if it, if it were uh, um, half-life. I'm going to empirical correctly here. The relationship between one over lambda and half-life. There's a log two. Which way does it go? Uh, <clears throat> either way, uh, ln of two is on the top. One over log two here. Uh, uh, ln of two. I did one over lambda. Yeah. Um, so the probability, this is a number of order unity, if, if I wait uh, one minute compared to, uh, for example, five hours, that's 300 uh, minutes, uh, the probability of one minute that you would get a decay of that nucleus is um, uh, uh, one over 300, so it's 0.3%. Now, you can watch it. Darn, it didn't decay. Let's watch another minute. <clears throat> What's the probability that it would decay? The same. If five days later, that persnickety nucleus still had not decayed, you say, well, come on. It's really got to decay right now. What's the probability it will decay in the next minute? It's exactly the same. You know? uh, that, the fact that these are independent events and the probability is the same at all times is what gives rise to the exponential. Um, okay. It's really interesting. It, it actually goes across the spectrum of human experience. In, in fact, uh, these are a couple of interesting YouTubes. I'll, I'll put them up on the web here. Um, there were scholarly articles written in Swedish about the decay, uh, exponential decay of, of beer foam. <laughs> And in fact, last year or two years ago, when I gave this course, I actually had people that could either do a, a problem over here, or they could do dice or coins, or you could go back and get a an expensive beer that had a good head that lived a long time and actually do the uh, and reproduce these results. And I think about half of the people in the class actually chose to do the paper on uh, beer, uh, but it actually works. So uh, we'll see this. Uh, potassium 40, a very important chronometer. Uh, and, and again, when we talk about forensics and attribution and all this, it turns out um, in you know, uh, both uh, um, uh, the um, when we start when we start looking at uh, looking for evidence that a country has been uh, engaging in, uh, in nuclear testing, uh, you look for spectroscopy you, and you also look for uh, <coughs> you know, half lives as well. Uh, you can learn a lot about uh, who, when, where, uh, and so forth uh, by a combination of spectroscopy and, and uh, also these kinds of temporal measurements, which change the relative fractions of daughters uh, of, of an event like this. Um, you, of course, know Paul Rennie. He's a collaborator of mine. Actually, we, um, uh, he and our, some of our group, Lee Bernstein and I, uh, he and his, the Berkman Geochronology Center built a high flux neutron generator for doing argon argon dating. So it's a more accurate way of doing potassium 40, argon 40. You actually look at, you transmute potassium 39 into 
R39, knowing the ratio of potassium 40 to potassium 39. And then in the same mass spec, you measure R39 and R40, and all the systematic errors cancel out. Very important chronometer, one and a quarter billion years, very comparable to the age of the Earth being 4.55 billion years. So very important uh, for doing um, paleochronology and geochronology. Um, ditto, this was uh, um, Willard Libby in the 1940s, uh, conceived of using carbon-14 uh, as a chronometer for doing dating. Uh, it's created in the upper atmosphere due to bombardment of cosmic rays. Uh, when things are in equilibrium um, with uh, the ecosystem, and you and I eat food, and food comes from plants and animals, and animals come from plants, uh, which have respired, have, have, uh, there's been a, uh, you know, picked up uh, from uh, the, the uh, uh, carbon from uh, the uh, uh, from the ecosystem. Um, that will have a fixed ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. Uh, once you fall out of the equilibrium, aka you die, uh, then in fact you're not exchanging, you're not getting a fresh source of carbon-14 and all the carbon-14 in you um, uh, begins to exponentially decay away. And you can date things uh, accurately even in some few decades, all the way to many tens of thousands of years with carbon-14. And let's see, I think whether I should attempt to launch out into, I think what I will do is hold on right now and uh, Wednesday will be a shared lecture with Professor Nye. And at that time, I'm gonna uh, give uh, kind of the intros to fission. So we're gonna kind of really warm to the topic that's important to this course here. And as I say, I think next week, Eric will give a little bit of a, a little bit more of a deeper dive on vision on the area of research and expertise. Any questions here? So if fusion is so good, how come nobody's doing it? It doesn't work. Ah, good. That's a very good question. It turns out um, the, the thing about fission is that I can take uh, this nucleus and then just drift in a slow neutron Nothing impedes the neutron from going in because it's a neutral object. In the case of fusion, although they're very light nuclei, the fact is they're both charged and you need to actually provide energy to, to surmount what's called the Coulomb barrier before they're, they're, the surfaces of their nuclei touch. The nuclear force is a very short range force. So the strategy is um, to make, for example, a plasma that's very hot, such that the average temperature will be in the many tens of thousands of electron volts, many tens of keV, such that nuclei will begin to surmount and quantum mechanically tunnel in to fuse with one another. So it's paying the price. Uh, there's a word for it in ordinary chemistry called um, activation energy. It's the nuclear equivalent of an activation energy. You have to provide, you have to get things, oomph, before they, the, the, the nuclear force takes over and you get the reaction to occur. And that's just been devilishly hard. The bugaboo, ever since the 1950s, has been instabilities, hydrodynamical uh, instabilities. Uh, plasmas are like trying to wrestle with a greased pig. You know, you try to squeeze it here and it squishes out over here. It's a, it's a big problem. It happens not only for magnetically confined fusion, it also happens for laser fusion as well. If you take these little pellets with nip, and even in the space of you know, a nanosecond, this thing is rocketing in at 300 kilometers a second. It's like half the escape velocity of the galaxy. And even going from two millimeters down to 30 microns, it developed these little Rayleigh Taylor fingers, these little fingering instabilities, and you don't get a good compression. So instability is terrible. In fact, uh, in the history of the bomb project, weeks before the Trinity test, a uh, very famous British physicist. He did many, many wonderful things in his career. Uh, G.I. Taylor happened to come through Los Alamos and he gave a lecture about instabilities. Um, ah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a YouTube video on, on what are called Rayleigh Taylor instabilities. Um, if I take a heavier fluid 
and accelerate it into a lighter fluid. Uh, if I accelerate a lighter fluid into a heavier fluid, everything is fine. If I accelerate a heavier fluid into a lighter fluid, um, what happens is that you get these little O'Reilly Taylor instabilities. Um, you go from this kind of thing. Um, I think I've got the sign here right, Eric. Uh, and I then look at the time sequence. What happens is that all of a sudden I begin to get this and then this, and then I get these fingers, and then I get these things which actually kind of look like mushroom caps. And then it becomes chaotic like this. So getting the fuel to mix is a big, big problem. This is time going down to this direction. And this is called a Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Um, and Oppenheimer and the theoretical division were so horrified by the lecture they heard, they redesigned the bomb about three or four weeks. Uh, this was the, the uh, plumbing device that needed to be tested um, to get as good a symmetric implosion as possible. They went back and they basically did a fundamental redesign with only a few weeks before they had scheduled the test. Um, this is a fascinating field. There are, there's also what's called, um, there's Rickmeyer and Meshkoff, and then what's the third instability called? If you, if you have two fluids that are flowing uh, this way of different density, you, get, uh, you, you then get instabilities which begin to grow, and then they start forming like this, you know. And then they, they then the thing becomes very, very, very turbulent. That's called uh, what? Anyway, I'll show you a few. You, you, this is hugely important for weapons physics. So it's instabilities are the name of the game. Um, and uh, whether you're dealing with a magnetically confined plasma or uh, an inertial confined plasma, it's frustrated us for 70 years. And that's been the problem. You know, it's easy enough to provide the energy to say, okay, I can actually get things instantaneously hot enough that I should get fusion, but it just, it, it has eluded us for a long, long time. Fusion was like falling off a log. Literally, from the time they discovered it in the summer of 1938, when they had the bomb and when they had reactors, was like that. Can't miss. Okay, see so you on Wednesday. Um, this is going to be a special session, isn't there? Uh, so our first discussion section is on Wednesday. It'll be 4 p.m. Uh, in Echeverry 1106. Um, attendance is optional but encouraged. Uh, for those who can't attend, uh, Mansuk and I will probably record uh, and post a link. And then my office hours are going to be 3.30 p.m. on Mondays in Echeverry 4101. And Mansuk will announce his office hours and the location, uh, I assume, on Wednesday. Very good. Great.